Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Bite Size PD today, mapping a year of writing. I'm so glad you could make it. And for the ELA teachers, you know that this is based on our book study for the year, 180 Days by Kelly Gallagher. But if you are not an ELA teacher, I still believe that these principles apply to you as a teacher who teaches writing within your own content. Okay, so here are our norms. And specifically for online PD, please mute your microphone. I'd love to see your faces if you feel comfortable turning on your cameras. And then if you have a question, please type it in the chat. Um, and it says you can update the norms. I forgot to fix that slide. So my updated norms would be just pop in, comment, interrupt me. I like the interaction. Everything we do is rooted in our framework. So today, our um, learning intention is that you're learning what elements to consider when you plan a year of writing. And your success criteria will be that you can plan common threads taught in every unit of writing. You can plan for time to conference with students. And, oh, I'm gonna fix this. I decided not to focus on that last one. It was too much. So we're gonna do that in a future professional development. Okay. So first I wanna talk about units of study or um, units of writing. So in the writing and literacy standards, we have argument, informational, narrative, and research. And those are kind of the way that we have our year planned where we do one quarter argument, one quarter informational, and so on. But what I find really interesting is that to really be considered a writer, you need to know argument. You need to be able to um, do informational writing. You need to have narrative and you need to have research. They all connect and work together because no matter what genre the writing is, there are common things that you're gonna do within every unit of study of writing. So I want you to think for a second and feel free to type in the chat your answer. What really is a writer? When you think of what a writer is, how would you define that to somebody? I'll give you a second to think. So I think for me, what a when I think about what a writer is and I think about real world writing, it is writing that is engaging. It's persuasive. I, as a reader, can't put it down. Um, even if I'm reading a journal article or very technical text, I, it still needs to be engaging enough and interesting enough for me to continue to want to read it. And I wonder if what we define a writer as is the same as the kind of writers we're developing in our classes. So kind of keep that in your mind because what I'm gonna to present today is kind of a different view or a different look at how we plan writing. So if we look at this writing standard, it's informational writing. Does this standard indicate form? or length in it. So when I read it, it says, write information explanatory texts to examine and convey complex ideas, concept, and information clearly and accurately through the effective selection, organization, and analysis of content. <clears throat> so does this have to be an essay? Does this have to be a five paragraph essay? Could this be a uh, an infographic? Could it be a script for a public service announcement? Could this be a commercial? I think it's really interesting that none of the writing standards actually use the word essay. In none of the writing standards does it say five paragraph. And yet those are the types of writing that we're always asking students to do. Those are the types of writing that we're assessing. 
but there are other ways and we can meet those standards with a large variety of writing. So when we look at other ways, right? I listed a few, but, oh, that should say these standards. <laughs> Um, you can meet the standards with blog posts, one scene screenplays, public service announcements, literary critiques, letters to the editor, personal themes, sales pitches, commercials, infographics, uh, political cartoons. There are so many ways that we can meet our writing standards that go outside of a traditional five paragraph essay form. And what's really interesting is that when we look in the book, and we talked about this on district day, students, when they go to college, have a lot of different types of writing that they're doing. And in college, they're not requiring five paragraph essays. We looked at the prompts that they had for college, and um, some of them are incredibly broad. There's no mention of length in some of them. If it is, it's a thousand words or something like that. So, you know, really think about other ways that we could be assessing this. Now, what I found really interesting was this graphic on page 83. And this is how Kelly and Penny planned their year of writing. So I want you to take a second to look at this and what do you notice about this year long plan? So one thing that I noticed is they have um, taken it out of a traditional quarter or semester calendar. And they've done this by weeks, um, but I was surprised by the variety of timelines that they had for students submitting work where they had very short amounts of time. They have one to two weeks to do an open choice writing assignment. Their choice, student choice, any topic, any form, any genre, they get to choose. And I love that because you really can get to know your students because they're gonna give you their best writing. They're gonna do a form or a genre that's their best that they feel comfortable with. And what a great way for us to pre-assess students really authentically. Um, and the other thing I noticed was <laughs> that's a lot of writing, a lot of writing. And I thought, well, how do they do this? And if we go back to their daily plans, if we go back to how they structured their year, they write every day in class. And that's how they're able to get this much writing from students. And I think that that's really exciting because the amount of growth that these students will get at the end of the year will be completely different than my students because I had them locked into a four quarter system and they didn't write as many products as I could have had them do. So how do they do this? So they give students actually multiple experiences to write within that unit of study. So if we go back, let's just take the narrative. Um, I think it was like their digital storytelling, multi-narrator writing or digital storytelling or digital storytelling. So they call them laps of writing. And when we get into the specific types of writing argument and such, they give examples of these, but they do laps of short pieces of writing that build to a larger piece. And I think of the couch to 5K model, right? The way I taught writing with one essay a quarter, we spent a lot of time on it. I was asking them to run a 5K when they had never run a 5K before. But if you do have a couch to 5K program, it's okay, walk for this amount of time, now walk for longer, now start jogging part of the time, you know, and then they work up to running a full 5K. 
And this is what Kelly and Penny do in their writing um, instruction, which I think is incredibly awesome because the first time a student tries an argument, it's short. That's really low stakes. And they get to succeed or fail. They get to progress. They get to learn from their writing. And then they try another one. And it's a little bit bigger. And another one. And it's a little bit bigger. And they work up to a final. It's not several drafts of the final. These are all different writing products. So here's an example in narrative. So they first say that their first lap is to swim in short memoirs. Using a mentor text is incredibly important in their model. So their reading that they're doing that day is tied to the text that they're, they're trying to write. Or they will take time out of writing to do mentor texts. And they use the mentor text to make note of the techniques of writing that the authors are using. And then they take those texts and it can help students brainstorm list for their own narratives. They can do quick writes um, on those lists that they've created. And they're really focusing in this first lap on zooming in in a moment of time, right? I'm trying to think like the moment I saw my dog for the first time and knew that I was going to adopt her, right? A moment. So then their second pass is I reworded it and I said, write a vignette or one scene. So what's really interesting is that they keep reading mentor texts. Then in this next, in this vignette, they're going to focus on showing, not telling, dialogue, and a major character. Those are the only three things that they're focusing on. So they're going to find mentor texts that align with those three things. On lap three, they're still gonna keep reading. They're still reading mentor texts. And this time they're gonna focus on organization and techniques that create momentum, transitions, minor characters, because lap three, students will now be writing either several connected scenes um, in one story, right? And this can be a short story format. It could be a poem format. It could be a screenwriting format. The format of the writing isn't as important as the techniques that they're teaching, right? Organization, momentum, transition, major characters. Then on the fourth pass, this is the 5K. This is the big project. They're going to write a new story. And this story, their focus will be the voice of the narrator, including literary elements and devices, experimenting with genre, maybe happens at this time, but this story will have major and minor characters in it. And it will be a full, fully fleshed out story. So in this, they're writing at least three different narrative pieces before they get to a final piece. So throughout the whole thing, they're reading examples, they're making note of the moves that other writers are doing and they're incorporating it in their own writing. Okay, common threads. This is a huge technique that they use. And I realized I did this, but not intentionally in my writing. So the common threads are the writing skills that you wanna teach that are transferable to any mode of writing. This is a quote from page 89 that I feel like really summed it up best. When we map out a year, it's critical to remember that so much of the writing curriculum, both process and craft, is not tied to any specific form or genre of writing. So if you go back and look at the, the rubrics or the standards, they're, they're very similar from argument to informational to narrative. There's still similar elements there, including the writing process, um, what we do after, the brains, I mean, everything, right? Those are going to be the same no matter what type of writing. So he goes on to, they go on to say, the bones of our writing units, leading students to generate ideas, teaching them to organize and revise them, and fine-tuning writing 
do not change as text or form changes. So those threads should be intentional. So here's a list. This is page 90. I tried to shorten um, how, what threads they identify for our teachers who are here who are not ELA teachers and don't have a copy of 180 days. Um, but these are things that they're that you're going to hit every time you do a writing piece. The next big thing when we think about writing, and I think a shift as we're planning for writing is to plan to conference with students. So many times I had essays due at the end of the quarter and I would spend the last two weeks of the quarter grading essays only to hand them back. And then there, there was nothing students could do about it at that point. And it wasn't until later on in my teaching career that I started to shift when I graded essays, how I graded essays, and how I gave feedback. And I did a bite-sized PD last year on tips for um, grading and ELA that I go through those processes in more detail. But for Kelly and Penny, they kind of have these steps when doing a conference. So the first one is to give students your full attention during the conference. And part of that is the students shares a goal or a question or what they would like help on. And then you have student led conferences at that point. And <laughs> they say, we're not sitting down to correct errors. We are sitting down to learn and to problem solve. And so you really become a writing mentor and a coach. I mean, we have instructional coaching, so you become a writing coach for the students and that's setting the purpose and having a student led conference or a student first conference really shows that their writing is important and it's not our writing or how we would do it. It's about their writing. Um, next, begin with listening. So we're gonna to listen to the students about what they want, what they hear, what they're trying. And then we're going to tell them what we hear. And they give um, sentence frames in the book, but this helps the writer understand how as a reader, we're experiencing their work. And so if a student shares a narrative with me and I have lots of questions about the character or where or how this is taking place, that's that tells the writer that they need to probably make some corrections and revisions around the character development. Okay, then you always make a plan for a next step. And I loved this idea that feedback in writing conferences should lead to action on the part of the student. The goal of the writing conference isn't to give feedback. The goal of the writing conference is to improve writing and they need that action. They quote John Hattie in the book on page 95 and John Hattie said this, while teachers see feedback as corrections, criticism, comments, and clarifications, for students, unless it includes where to next information, they tend to not use it. I mean, raise your hand if you've written feedback on a student essay and they, they look at their grade and throw their paper in the garbage. I mean, it's wild, right? So he goes on to say, students want feedback that's just for them, just in time, and just a helping nudge forward. And I know that feedback can be very overwhelming, always. And I think I probably gave too much feedback sometimes in writing, right? Too much to handle. So he goes on and says, so worry more about how students are receiving your feedback than increasing how much you give. So we want to focus on really good feedback. Um, their next element for conferencing is allowing writers to make their own decisions. We can suggest next steps, but we don't tell students how to work. 
um, the writer is always in control and it really honors them as writers if they can own their writing. And they can't own their writing if we're pointing to their paper and saying, change this. And I would say this. And then, oh, and have I done this where I write what I, how I would write it above their sentence and cross out their sentence. That is not student led and it is not allowing students to own their writing. So it has to be their choice. That's engaging, that's empowering students. And then last is to connect students with writers groups, right? Have students working together in a writing group. This can build a community of connection, support in your classroom, a community of writers. And the focus is the exact same. I'm struggling with this section. Does this character and dialogue make sense? How do you, can you picture this as my, are my descriptions good enough? And students can give feedback on that. And if you go into your book, there's a video, um, a set of video, videos that they've made. You just, on page XI, is that 11 in the preface? They show you how to log in. They have video of students um, conferencing with each other over Flipgrid because it was during the pandemic. So, so, okay. So here's the big question. How do we fit this in? How do we fit in many more units and conferencing? We have so little time. So for conferencing, do it during starters. Do it during independent reading time. Um, if we're reading aloud every single day to our high school students, I mean, every day, like read an entire novel out loud to them, are students doing any of the reading? Is that the best use of our time? So have students read independently and you can do writing conferences. Do, do it while they're drafting and writing. I used to walk up and down the aisle and just read a little bit and conference with a student real quick, read a little bit and conference with a student. And so by the time they got to the end of their paper, they would have multiple conferences with me all on sections of their paper that they could immediately work on. Do it during your academic prep period, um, whatever that's called at your school, if you have one. And you can do it before or after school, but set boundaries like one or two days a week and they they need to be short conferences, okay? So keep them short, like one question from the student that guides the conversation. There's one focus, one piece of feedback for improvement. So make it the most essential or the most important. And usually that's what's most important to the student. Um, you might not get to every student in every piece of writing right? If you have a short unit that's only three or four weeks long, they're writing, they're submitting, and a student never comes in before after school. The student never seeks out extra help, and you don't get to them in class, you might not get to them for that piece of writing, but you will get to them for the next one. And then just remember that a few writing conferences is better than not doing any because you don't know how you'll get to everybody, right? So that's the that's the the big bulk of this um, on writing conferences. And if you're interested, um, check out our email. We are doing podcasts on this chapter, and I have on the website additional information um, that we'll be sending out on writing conference with some videos of Kelly and Penny doing those things and some, an article to read and those sorts of things. So thank you so much for being here. Don't forget to um, go to the PD page and sign up to get your relicensure credit. And as always, you can always email me, Leslie Morris, L-E-S-L-I dot M-O-R-R-I-S or Scott Christensen. Um, we're happy to come out and work with you or answer questions or brainstorm solutions because we want more writing um, in our classrooms. Thank you.